the third try for trying to get this content up to you guys. So I'm hoping this is going to work out. I keep forgetting to turn on my microphone. Silly me, living and learning um, in the age of technology. So I wanted to finish off our conversation uh, this week with um, the last part of the story as far as um, molecules go. And if you recall, we're really talking about um, polarity. And so I'm going all the way back to our objectives really quickly just to kind of go back there. And our last two items that we wanted to talk about are electronegativity and determining the polarity of a bond and then also the polarity of a molecule. And so what happens here is we're going to put all these concepts together, um, the shape of a molecule, uh, this idea of unequal sharing of electrons between atoms, um, and the symmetry of these molecules so that we can determine um, the polarity. And basically, polarity is really important. Um, you probably know that oil and water don't mix. Maybe you know that because you like uh, balsamic vinegar and olive oil on your bread. Perhaps you know it as you've noted um, when you've thrown the oil into your pan when you're cooking your pasta with your water. It doesn't mix. And thankfully we know too that um, the bad thing of an oil spill, um, the oil actually floats on the water. We, that's a density issue, but it's also an emissibility or a solubility issue. Thankfully that oil doesn't mix with the water and we can skim it off the top theoretically. Okay, so the first thing we have to do is finish co the conversation and talk a little bit about this concept of electronegativity. Um, we have referred to uh, this, um, this table right here. I'm gonna erase this so it's all clean for us. This is our periodic table um, that looks a little different than the other one, um, but it's talking about electronegativity. And basically electronegativity is the attraction, a measure of the attraction that an atom has for electrons. And we'll talk a little bit about that. This periodic table is set up where we've got, you know, that atomic number at the top, but down here, rather than the mass, we're seeing the electronegativity. And I just want to remind you guys a couple of a couple of things. Um, we are familiar with the periodic table here where we're looking at ions. We spoke about this this week as well. Um, we said that, you know, if we roughly divide that periodic table in half, um, you know, these guys over here are the um, non-metals. Let me try that again. Those are the non-metals, right? Um, and they tend to um, grab electrons and, and be anions. And the reason for that is they're really, really close to that octet, right? That octet, that um, getting those eight electrons in the outer energy level, except for hydrogen and helium, they only want two. And we've learned too that the metals over here they actually prefer to give away their electrons and become cations to go back to the nearest noble gas, right? So they all want to get to these noble gas structures because there's some stability, some low energy there. So it may make sense to you if you think about that, that these guys are going to want electrons. They want electrons. And these guys don't want them so much. So they are willing to give away electrons. And so it may mean that when we look at the electronegativity values, You'll notice that, you know, um, when we divide this, when we divide this in half, right, these guys over here have a higher um, electronegativity than these guys over here. Um, so electronegativity has to do with that. It has to do with um, that attraction for electron, that ability to get to that noble gas structure. And the other piece of it is the radius of the atom. If you think about those protons in the center, right, and um, we've got these electrons being placed outside, um, the farther you get away from that nucleus, um, the less that attraction is. And so it has a, it has a kind of a two-tiered um, component to it. So we'll just write that definition down. So electronegativity um, is the measure of the attraction an atom has for electrons. Not good English, but that'll do. Okay. Um, and so... This, this manifests itself um, in the fact that um, basically um, bonds and molecules can have this unequal distribution of electrons, unequal um, electron distribution, distribution, it's early, I haven't had enough coffee yet. Um, okay, let me try that one more time. I'm gonna write that out so it looks nicer. Um, distribution 
And so we have sort of these electron clouds that are unequal, okay? Um, so there's, um, there's more electrons kind of on one side of a bond, um, and so that basically gives this distribution. So I'm gonna show you what that might look like in a second. Um, but let's just talk about how do we actually measure electronegativity. So we, we call something a polar bond. We're gonna just give you some numbers here. Um, if the, the difference in the electronegativity is greater than or equal to 0.5. So when we say that, and I'm gonna do some examples down here, we call it a nonpolar bond if the difference in the electro difference in electronegativity is less than 0.5. So basically we go back to that table and we can look at those numbers and we can give you a range, right? So let's talk about that um, down here. So and we'll talk about this electron distribution as well. So this question right here gives us a little thing to work with. <coughs> Excuse me. So this is asking us, um, talk to us about, it says label the bond formed between carbon and each of the following elements as nonpolar, polar, or ionic. So we're talking about a carbon carbon bond here. And here's this sort of um, application of this concept right here. We're gonna decide if it's polar or nonpolar. We have to go back to our chart. We're looking at carbon. We're looking at carbon. Its electronegativity is 2.5. Okay, so one of, one of those things, it, it's nice to know this actually, because you're gonna use carbon over and over again. So when we subtract these from each other, we get zero. So that fits in this category right here. So we're gonna say this is a non-polar covalent bond. Covalent bond. Okay, and what that actually means when we talk about distribution is it means that there's gonna be, um, elect these atoms are pulling on electrons with equivalent forces. And so there's gonna be this symmetry of the electron clouds around the carbon, and that's the important piece, okay? Um, so the symmetry is going to play a large role in this conversation. Okay, so let's talk about another couple of um, important bonds that you're gonna deal with. Um, so let's talk about a carbon-oxygen bond, okay? It happens to be a double bond in most cases, but we'll just leave it like that. Okay, so when we look at this, we know this is 2.5. And if we go back to our chart, we know oxygen is 3.5. Um, and so, again, I'm gonna separate, I'm gonna subtract these, but I'm gonna take the absolute value of it and I get one. Okay, so that fits in this category right here. So this is gonna be a polar bond. So this is gonna be a polar covalent bond. And what that actually means is that in the distribution of electrons, there's gonna be a lot more electrons hanging around the oxygen than they're gonna be around the carbon. And we have this asymmetry, okay, asymmetry. And what that means is we're actually gonna have something called a dipole. So we're gonna have a dipole. And we can uh, show dipoles in a couple different ways. One of them is we use these little cursive Ds to show the positive and the negative. And the other is we show an arrow that points in the direction of the more electronegative element and it has a little plus sign on the end. So this is gonna point to the more electronegative element. Okay, so there's the way we might show that. So on this one, we're gonna show it, there's a negative side and there's a positive side. And that's just the slight, the slight, um, difference because the electrons are hanging out more around the oxygen, which makes them more negative, this atom more negative. We can also show that dipole um, by, by writing it as an arrow that goes in the direction of the oxygen and has a little plus sign. And if you've ever heard of a vector, um, a vector is an arrow that its length indicates the size. And so you might draw a large vector for a larger dipole and a small vector for a smaller dipole. And that's kind of how that goes. Okay, another important substance uh, bond that you're gonna run into a whole bunch is the carbon-hydrogen bond. So let's look at that carbon-hydrogen bond. You know the carbon is 2.5, and if we go back to our chart, we know that hydrogen is 2.1. So we'll look at that. So when we subtract those, we get 0.4, right? So if I'm doing the absolute value, and that fits into this category as well. So this is gonna be a non-polar covalent bond. Okay, so that's kind of nice to commit to memory. Um, this is just, there is a little bit of a distribution. There's a little more sort of pull um, of the electrons by the carbon. Um, but for the most part, um, you know, this is going to be fairly symmetrical, right? There's probably a little 
little bit more around the carbon than there is around the hydrogen, um, but for the most part, we're gonna think of them as fairly symmetrical because we just kind of have put, you know, this is our cutoff, right? We're gonna call that nonpolar. So that's good for you to commit to memory. Um, you know, just noticing that um, anytime you have two atoms of the same type, there's never gonna, there's, it's not gonna be polar. And all carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar because we're going to have so many of those. And it's nice to know that carbon-oxygen bonds are going to be polar as well. Um, I think I misspoke. I want to make sure. Carbon-carbon bonds are nonpolar. Carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar. And carbon-oxygen bonds are polar. And then I just want to point out the last one here, the, the lithium and the carbon. So if we think about lithium and carbon stuck together, uh, what I want you to recognize is you know, that is a, lithium is a metal, carbon is a non-metal, so that would be classified as an ionic bond. And if you were to do that difference in electronegativity, you would find that it's very large. Um, this is 1.0 and this is 2.5. And so that's a, if we do 1.5, right, um, that's a large difference. And so it's like um, ionic bonds are the epiphany of electronegativity. Um, you know, the metal actually transfers its electron. They're not shared, it's transferred. And so that makes it very different. And we had a little sheet that we were talking about um, ionic bonds on here, and I'm gonna go back to it really quick. I know you guys hate when I scroll like that. Okay, so, you know, we classify ionic and covalent bonds. So hopefully, we, you know, you watched the demo that Scott did and he kind of gave us um, the properties of these. We're recognizing, you know, that um, these guys are uh, non-metal and non-metal. But what we want to do is, you know, we have a naming system. We have the nomenclature um, of this, right? Um, this one is um, the metal and then the non-metal, right, with the IDE ending. Um, and then we have the Roman numerals, right? And then we have the polyatomics. Right, so that's kind of it with ionic, um, and that's where we're going to leave it. On this one, we also have nomenclature, right? And it's easier. It has the prefixes, right? And I said the other day, very few ionic compounds are going to have prefixes in there. So make sure you're paying attention to the two different ways to name it. But then what's also interesting is then we can divide this into um, polar and nonpolar, right? So we... We can call this a polar covalent bond, and we can call this a non-polar covalent bond. And again, just kind of giving that um, a little bit more, you know, the difference in electronegativity of greater than or equal to 0.5 makes it polar, and the difference in electronegativity of less than 0.5 makes it non-polar. So those are some numbers that you might want to make sure you put on your sort of cheat sheet, right, so that you have that. And again, making sure you can refer to this table right here um, over and over again to make those decisions. Okay, going back. Let's see how this manifests now. So uh, let's talk about this. So we've talked a little bit about the dipole. We've got that down. Um, let's look at some examples. Um, I'm gonna do a couple of different substances um, and uh, talk a little bit about the dipoles um, and, and helping you kind of get to this place where what does it mean to say the dipoles cancel? And how do we determine if a molecule is polar or nonpolar? So I'm going to give myself some space here. Um, and I'm going to do um, a couple of different substances. So we're going to do hydrogen fluoride. I want to talk about it. I want to talk about hydrogen. Um, I'm also going to talk about water. Um, and I think I want to do carbon dioxide. So I can talk to you a little bit about that. Um, all right, we'll do a couple. So Basically, um, it's going to boil down to this. Um, we're going to over and over again have this sort of set of rules. We're going to do the Lewis structure. Okay. Um, and then we're going to go into um, the shape of the molecule. And that's that um, linear, right? Linear, uh, trigonal planar, tetrahedral, and then the subsets of that. And then you're going to talk about electronegativity and the bonds. And then the fourth thing you have to think about is the symmetry and how all that plays together, right? So that's kind of how that's gonna go. So let's start easy um, with hydrogen fluoride and let's talk about that. So we know we have um, one hydrogen with one electron and one fluorine with seven electrons. Um, we're gonna put, the, there's just, there is no central atom on this one. So we're gonna put the hydrogen in here with its one electron and then we'll put the fluorine in here with its seven 
and we have this linear shaped molecule right where um, we've got hydrogen attached to fluorine but when we look at the electronegativity of these guys we go okay well fluorine has it's the most electronegative element in terms of the radius being really small and it being really close to the noble gas and hydrogen is 2.1 so we think about the electronegativity let's see so this is 4 and 2.1 and so we have a difference of 1.9 right it's a polar covalent bond and the dipole again depending on how you like to show it okay um it's going to be in the direction of the fluorine meaning that we're going to have this big electron cloud around the fluorine and a teeny one around the hydrogen so we have um, this dipole we can show this way or we can show it with those little cursive D's. Okay, so there's that. When we think about hydrogen, um, you know, when we look hydrogen and we put it together, right, um, this diatomic particle, you know, here these guys are um, sharing their electrons between them to get to that noble gas structure of helium. And what we have here is, you know, 2.1 minus 2.11 is zero. So we have this pure um, covalent bond, right? Um, pure covalent bond, meaning the electrons are shared equally. And there is no dipole. There's no, there's, there's all kinds of symmetry here. You know, the cloud is going to be perfectly symmetrical because the electrons are going to be sort of surrounding or swarming around those atoms with e equivalency. They both want the electrons as much as the other. Okay, so when we, when we start talking about, I'm going to give myself some more space here. When we start talking about water, okay, water, H2O, um, we've, we've looked at this before, right? So we think about the Lewis structure, two hydrogens, so um, two times one electron, one oxygen, so one times six electrons, so eight electrons total. Water's going to, uh, oxygen's going to be our central atom. I'm going to put in the hydrogens. I'm going to put in um, the electrons to share, so two and two to make a single bond. So I've used up four electrons, and I have four left. A hydrogen doesn't need them, so they actually go on the oxygen. So then we think about the shape of this guy, right? So our shape of it is going to be oxygen with a hydrogen and a hydrogen and a lone pair and a lone pair. And so we call this bent, is what we learned the other day. So we're going to call this a bent structure. So there's our molecular shape, right? And then we look at electronegativity. Um, if you recall, I go back to the chart, and oxygen is 3.5 and hydrogen is 2.1. So I'm going to consider that. So um, 3.5 and 2.1 and 2.1. So now what I have is I have these polar bonds, right? So I have these polar bonds and the dipole is going to go this direction and make it even fatter this direction right so this is positive this dipole goes this direction and they're equivalent and what we have to think about and this is the part that's difficult for students is the two of these working together in this bent shape in this sort of bent shape coming from the tetrahedral there's going to be an so these are the bond dipoles these are the bond dipoles there's two of them, right? But the net dipole goes this direction, right? It's a combination of the two of them. And so basically what we have here is we have, you know, sort of this side of the molecule is super negative and this side is positive. And when you think about it, I probably should have done it. Let's do this. I don't like that. Do it this way. We, we, we think about these clouds here. So it looks like Mickey Mouse, right? So there's this positivity over here. So that's kind of the thought process. And this is going to be a polar. Um, they ha it has polar bonds, right? Two polar bonds. And then the molecule is polar. And that's because of the asymmetry, right? So we've got, we have to think about all these things working together. So we, do, we said, we, let's do the Lewis structure. Let's get to the shape, right? Um, and then let's think about the bonds in terms of single bonds within the molecule. And then we want to think about the three dimensions of how those bonds are working together with the geometry, right, to decide if this is polar or nonpolar. Okay, let me give you another one. Um, so this is an example of a polar molecule with polar bonds. 
The other one I wanted to do was I wanted to do a methane, so CH4. We might call this based on what we've been talking about earlier, carbon tetrahydride, as uh, we practice the name. We might figure out that um, you know we've got carbon as our central atom. We've got eight electrons in here. Okay, putting in between. So, you know, we've got that one carbon with four electrons, right? The four hydrogens with um, four times one electron that gives us the eight electrons. And then we just use them all up connecting it. So then we go, oh, okay, this is a tetrahedral shape. So we draw that as a tetrahedral. And we call this methane. This, uh, that's kind of the common word for it, right? Like I, I called this uh, dihydrogen monoxide the other day, and we said that's water, right? Um, that we can call this the the common name for this is methane. Regardless, um, we've got th four bonds here: one, two, three, four, and all of them are nonpolar. We we think about okay, so we have nonpolar bonds. And so when we think about the symmetry of that 109.5 everywhere, right? 109.5, this would be a nonpolar molecule. Now, just for interest sake, uh, let's just say that we're gonna change one of these. Uh, and so we're gonna make it, um, so let's make it CH3Cl. And so one of these, one of these hydrogens gets replaced with a chlorine. All of a sudden, I've got this polar bond in here, and I've got asymmetry. So chlorine is gonna draw those electrons to it with more force than the hydrogen is. We're gonna have this um, cloud of electrons around here that's gonna be different than the other three. And so you can, ha you can see, perhaps, that you're gonna have this asymmetry. You're gonna have this negative side, and you're gonna have this sort of positive ends. And the manifestation of all of that is gonna be a polar bond because of asymmetry. So that's kind of what it boils down to, okay? So we think about a dipole, right? So a dipole is this um, unequal uh, sharing of electrons symbolized by an arrow, right? Or um, the cursive Ds, right? Um, if we did one more and we did carbon dioxide, this would give us an example of how these dipoles might cancel. So I'm going to do one more. I'm going to do carbon dioxide. Again, just kind of getting that Lewis structure out there. One carbon, um, which means I have four electrons and two oxygens, which means I have two times six electrons. Where am I getting that information? You know, that's coming from the periodic table, thinking about you know, how many valence electrons that oxygen has and how many carbon has. So hopefully you're getting good at that. So this means I have uh, 16 electrons, right? We know carbon's gonna go in the center because carbon has the most bonds. We're gonna put oxygen just for symmetry purposes on either side. We're gonna show those electrons connecting them, right? So we're gonna put two electrons there and two there. So we use four up and we have 12 electrons left. And then there's kind of just this um, trial and error that students don't like about the Lewis structure, right? So if I put two there, two there, and two there, just for symmetry purposes, that feels good. I'm like, oh yeah, okay, well that looks good. But um, the problem is, you know, this oxygen has its eight and this oxygen has its eight, but this carbon only has four and that's not gonna do it all, okay? So this is where that trial and error goes. And so I'm gonna undo all that and think about, well, what if I take off um, these electrons right here and put them in the middle, right? So if I put them here. Um, so then we're getting a little bit closer, right? That oxygen is happy and, and carbon's getting six this time. So that's getting closer. So if we go back and we undo um, these electrons, uh, so let's undo these two and do the same. Oops, I did not mean to do that. Let's go back. Um, we go back and do those two and do the same thing, right? So we put them in there and put them right there instead. We've used up all 16 of our electrons, right? Um, two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16. And then we get something like this. We get, um, let's see, we get our carbon and then we get a double bond with oxygen, a double bond with oxygen. And just for symmetry purposes, I'm gonna put those lone pairs out there. 
So we get something like this, okay? Um, double bonded oxygen to carbon. And then we think about, again, that um, electronegativity. We know this is 2.5 and this is 3.5. See, we've looked at those bonds, right? We know that this is a polar bond in the direction of the oxygen. And so we can show those dipoles in here. Uh, let's see what color we should use. Oh, let's do, no, that's not greenish. Oh, let's do this blue. Okay, so we've got a dipole in this direction, right? And we've got a dipole in this direction. And because they're equal and opposite, right? We have equal and opposite dipoles. We can say that the dipoles cancel, right? And so even though this molecule has two polar bonds, right? Um, the dipoles cancel, and so this is a nonpolar molecule, okay? And that again goes back to like our kind of steps, right? So we said, well, let's think Lewis structure, and then let's talk about shape, and I didn't mention that. Basically, this is linear, if you noticed, right? 180 degrees between them. And then basically thinking about each of the bonds individually, um, and then thinking about how they manifest all together, right? So um, it's a big idea, and it's a lot of work, and um, but understanding this is really kind of important. Okay, I think I've answered this question, but I wanted to give you some examples here. So um, as we look at this, um, we are looking at the shape, okay? So we wanna look at the shape. Um, so what we wanna recognize is, okay, well that carbon right there, has one, has one, two, three things attached to it, right? So one, two, three things. So this shape right here, um, right there, is gonna be trigonal planar. Okay, this shape right here is also gonna be trigonal planar. But what you notice is that, um, or may not notice, but we're gonna look at chlorine's electronegativity is 3.0 and carbon's is 2.5. So here's an example of, um, let's see, let me draw these in here for you. So here's an example of this bond being nonpolar, right? Because it's a carbon-carbon. But that bond is polar, and that bond is polar, and that bond is polar, and that bond is polar. And this molecule is flat and in the plane. So I have four polar bonds, one nonpolar bond. But when we look at how they work together, because they are all symmetrical and they're all equal, this is going to be a nonpolar molecule, okay? Four polar bonds, one nonpolar bond, but when we look at it all together, we get a nonpolar molecule because of the symmetry. So then we get a little more complicated. Um, we start thinking about um, what's going on here. Well, this is a, a tetrahedral shape, so this is a tetrahedral, if you can see that, right? Um, this hydrogen's coming out at us. That carbon is going back into the plane. And then I get this uh, trigonal planar shape in there. Okay, so I've got um, this, this substance right here has a tetrahedral shape. Um, this carbon right here has a trigonal planar shape. So we have to think about that and how that manifests. Um, we know that this bond, this bond, and this bond are nonpolar, um, as is this bond, all nonpolar. When we look at these bonds, this one right here, we already said is polar. We just did it right here. So we know this is polar in the direction of the oxygen. Um, the chlorine bond, um, we said the chlorine is three, not as big as the oxygen. So oxygen has an electronegativity of 3.5, 2.5, and 3.0. So this one has a dipole as well, but it's not quite as big. And when we think about how this molecule is going to behave and how these dipoles are gonna to work together, right? You might understand that, you know, there's gonna be a dipole kind of in this direction with, with these two things working together. Regardless, we can call this a polar molecule, okay? Due to molecule, let me try that again. Due to asymmetry. Okay, so that's the big idea, okay? Um, asymmetry also kind of shows up. Asymmetry also shows up when you're talking about, I just wrote ass on there, I didn't mean to. Um, <laughs> asymmetry basically is, you know, anytime there are uh, polar bonds and um, the dipoles don't cancel, 
okay? And, and you need to understand what that means, right? Um, asymmetry also happens when there are lone pairs, okay? So often, like with water, that showed up here, you know, this, this sort of asymmetry of having these lone pairs out here also manifests in... Um, um, in that, that concept of asymmetry and the polarity of a molecule. Okay, let me show you where we're going with this. This is huge. Um, so this is kind of the last piece here that I wanna to get to today. Uh, so basically, um, when we think about all of this coming together and next week we'll talk about these big biomolecules and we're gonna think about all these small pieces that we've worked with, right? So this gets us kind of going in the direction of where we're gonna go next week. All right, so this is glycine, and um, just like um, the cysteine, this is also an amino acid. Um, it is also going to be, uh, they are the building blocks of proteins. So we put these together in long chains and we build proteins. Perhaps you have spoken about protein synthesis um, in your life, or you will if you go into biology here in the near future. Okay, so here's our charge. We're looking at this molecule. We're thinking about the, the geometry around each one of these atoms. So this atom and that atom and that atom all have their own unique geometry. Um, and again, that geometry is that linear, right? Trigonal planar, tetrahedral, and those two sort of subsets of tetrahedral, uh, trigonal pyramid and bent. Okay, so those are kind of our, our five different shapes that are common, right? There's another bent one too off of here, but that's really, really rare. Okay, so it says, and, and we have to think about lone pairs when we do that. So what I wanna remind you guys of is um, our, our biggies, our, uh, our, our atoms that are gonna be really important to us. Oxygen, you know, with its two lone pairs and two places to make um, bonds. Nitrogen with its one lone pair and its three places to make a bond. Carbon being that one that makes four bonds. Um, and then of course hydrogen, right? So just those are our biggies uh, when we're dealing with these biomolecules. And so when we put the lone pairs in here, it wants us to put in lone pairs and then count the total number of valence electrons that are in glycine. So we're gonna put in our, um, our, our lone pairs for nitrogen, two on the oxygen and two on this oxygen. And then we're gonna count up all of the valence electrons reminding you that valence electrons are the ones involved in bonding, and there are two of them, right? So for every bond, there's two electrons. We're gonna count them. Two, four, six, eight, 10, 12, 14, 16, 18, 20, 22, 24, 26, 28, and 30. So we have 30, uh, 30, lone, 30 electrons involved in the bonding. Just reminding you guys that we said that, you know, um, an atom, between an atom, you know, that's one set of electrons and a double bond, right, remember is four electrons total. That's why I counted the four right there, okay? So 30 electrons total. Okay, big work here. It says determine the shape around the four indicated atoms. So we're gonna just, um, I'm gonna erase this work so that we can see this better. Um, we do wanna put those lone pairs back in there though. So I'm gonna put in the lone pair, oops, I want them bigger. Lone pairs, lone pairs, lone pairs. Okay, so um, let's label these um, one, two, three, and four. So when we look at the shape around the nitrogen, um, hopefully if I draw that out for you, and I'll, I'm gonna go to another page here, so let's add it. So if I draw the nitrogen um, up there, and I look at that, I go, okay, well, I've got these lone pairs, I've got two hydrogens, right? And um, next to it is a carbon. So there's a carbon here and then there's all kinds of other stuff. So what I want you to think about is, okay, I've got three atoms and a lone pair, and hopefully you are, you are getting to the place where you might call this um, a trigonal pyramid. Okay, it's three atoms and a lone pair. If you're not quite there yet, you have this little cheat sheet right here, right? Uh, three atoms and a lone pair, there, there it is. Okay, often with nitrogen. Okay, so um, if we go back and we look at number two here, we've got this carbon in here, so number two. So if I were to draw that out, um, I've got this, um, I've got this carbon, I'm going back. It's got a hydrogen on either side. 
it's got that nitrogen and all that other stuff over here and it's got this carbon um, and I'll just kind of draw that like that because we're going to talk about that later. But what you think about is there's one, two, three, four atoms attached to that carbon. And maybe, maybe, maybe you're at the place where this is a tetrahedral shape. So this is our number one. This is our number two. Tetrahedral shape. We don't even worry about what's going on past it, right? We don't care what's going on out here. We just look at, um, here's our atom, right? This is our atom. And it's got one, two, three, four atoms attached. So we call that a tetrahedral shape. Okay, so there's number two. We've got number one. Let's look at number three. So number three says, okay, well, we've got this, um, we've got this carbon in here. Um, and it's got um, a double bonded oxygen, an OH group here, and another carbon over here. And then there's all this other stuff. Okay, so there's dot, dot, dot. So basically, again, we're looking at, there's our central atom, three atoms attached, right? 120 degrees between, and that would be trigonal planar, right? Different than trigonal pyramid. Trigonal pyramid is lifted a little bit, and the angles are closer to 109.5. These are 109.5, okay? And then number four, um, number four here, we've got this, um, number four we've got this oxygen attached to a hydrogen there's two lone pairs and it's got a carbon over here so um, I'm looking at this oxygen right there it's got that carbon and then all kinds of other stuff right so this has um, central atom two lone pairs and two atoms and hopefully 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 you're at the place where you can see that this is a bent shape and uh, somebody in class when we were lecturing yesterday said, oh, that's just like oxygen in water. Yes, um, oxygen often um, has a uh, bent shape because of those two lone pairs. Okay, so that gets us that one. Got that one done. Label all the polar bonds. Okay, so just kind of thinking and reminding yourself that carbon-carbon bonds and carbon-hydrogen bonds are nonpolar, right? Um, we looked at um, over here, and I did it on purpose. So uh, we looked at um, the carbon-oxygen bond we said is always going to be polar. So let's go back and think about that. So the carbon-oxygen, shoot, the carbon-oxygen bond is going to be polar. And if you think about it, um, the other ones we have to worry about are the nitrogen-hydrogen bond, carbon-carbon-carbon-hydrogen. Um, the oxygen-hydrogen carbon, carbon, bond is going to be important. How many else? We've, we've got um, carbon, 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 hydrogen, carbon, oxygen, um, oxygen. I think we, I think that, oh, and then the nitrogen carbon bond. Let's see, the nitrogen carbon bond. So let's just think about these. Go back to our electronegativity chart. Um, and we go, okay, nitrogen is three. Um, nitrogen is three. Um, so um, let's put that in there. Oops, I need to go here. I'm flipping around, aren't I? Okay, so we know this is uh, we know this is polar. So this is uh, two point five and three point five. What did I just say? Nitrogen is three point zero. Hydrogen is two point one. Three point five, two point one, three point zero, two point five. Okay, so basically, long story short, um, these all these bonds are going to be polar. This one's going to go towards the oxygen. This one's going to go towards the nitrogen. This one's gonna to go towards the oxygen, and this one's gonna to go towards the nitrogen. So when we go back in here and think about all these bonds, right? So we have to manifest that. So basically, there's gonna be a polar bond, a polar bond, and a polar bond, right? Nonpolar, 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 polar bond, polar bond, polar bond. And so when we think about how this goes into shape, it gets kind of crazy really fast. But basically what we can do is say, you know, this is going to be a polar molecule, and that's because of asymmetry. But that is the process by which you want to kind of go through, right? So um, thinking about how are these all going to manifest. This is kind of crazy. You know, this one's going to kind of, all those three working together are going to kind of give us a net dipole this direction. This one's going to kind of have it go up towards the oxygen. And so there's going to be all these kind of weird places where the electrons are going to kind of hang out more. So it's hard to visualize that. And so we just fall back on, oh, yeah, asymmetry. It's, it's all good. 
okay, last but not least, let's talk about serotonin. We're starting to get into um, these circles of carbons and all that kind of noise. Um, and this is pushing you a little bit. Again, we're, I'm pushing you a little bit into stuff we're going to talk about next week. Okay, this one is saying um, basically fill in the lone pairs. It wants lone pairs. And it wants double bonds to give everybody the usual bonding pattern. Uh, we know oxygen makes two bonds. Nitrogen makes three. Carbon makes four. Hydrogen makes one. Um, we know that um, oxygen generally has those two lone pairs and nitrogen has that one. And so we go through and we find all the nitrogens and we give it an extra lone pair, lone pair. Um, and we've put in lone pairs on the oxygen, right? So basically that's how that's going to manifest. We have to think about those. And then, you know, as we look, we can start to think about what are the shapes around these guys, right? Um, but yet we need to put in double bonds. So Basically, we want to remind ourselves. So we, we go through and we just check everything. Like, okay, well, that nitrogen has three bonds and a lone pair. It's good. That carbon has its four bonds. That carbon has its four bonds. Um, that carbon does not. And so I'm going to just put in a double bond right here. So that that carbon, um, this carbon right here now has, uh, this carbon right here has four bonds. This carbon has four bonds. Um, that nitrogen is good because it's got its three and its lone pair. I'm going to throw in another double bond right there. That makes um, that carbon good, that carbon good. This carbon needs a double bond. Whoops. This carbon needs a double bond right there. And I think that carbon needs a double bond. And I think everybody's good. So I know this is a push, um, but we're going, going back to some of these, you know, these sort of things that we know about these common atoms, nitrogen, oxygen, carbon, and hydrogen. Um, and, and kind of playing with this and looking at, you know, serotonin, it's a neurotransmitter. It's kind of cool to think about um, your serotonin. Are you sleeping well? Um, is your temperature being regulated well, et cetera, et cetera. Okay, I think that will do. Um, I'm hoping this one works out with the sound. Um, I hope you guys are having a great day.